really a special pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Sakakibara back to Michigan because uh, uh, her PhD is from this institution. She's uh, an alumna. Um, please uh, help me welcome her back. Uh, and uh, the title of her talk, as you see, is Rethinking the Post-Defeat Discursive Space, Censorship During the Occupation Period. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much. My name is Richie Sakakivara, and I'm very happy to be here. I'm now teaching modern Japanese literature at Waseda University in Japan. The last time I was here was the summer of 1999 when I was defended my dissertation. I was writing under Ken. And I've always wanted to come back here, but I was also thinking, well, not, not during the winter. <laughs> But um, here I am at the worst time of the year. <laughs> but I'm still I'm very happy to be back here. Okay. Um, the title of my talk today is Rethinking the Post-Defeat Discursive Space, the Censorship During the Occupation Period. After I've sent this title to Ken, I realized that, that this is a very awkward and inadequate title and needs a lot of explanation. But I hope at least I, commun I have communicated that my talk was about the censorship and the one during the U.S. occupation of Japan. I'd like to focus on censorship on literary works, um, even though I didn't say a word about literature in my title. And I would like to discuss the influence of the censorship on post-war Japanese literature. There are three sections in my talk today. Um, I'd like to begin by outlining the US censorship system, basic facts like when, by whom, and how it worked. I'm not going too much into the occupation period itself, since many fine historical studies about the period have already exist in English. <laughs> but I feel it essential to illustrate how literary scholars have defined this period and how that's related to the recent achievement in the study of the censorship I want to pursue. I would then like to move on to the discussion with more concrete examples using actual literary texts that were censored. I will look at the deleted passages and see the what were the things that the censorship authority wanted to erase and what were the implications of it. I have three examples ready, Nakano Shigeharu, Nagayo Yoshiro, and Tanizaki Juinchiro's work. But when I was timing my presentation, I realized that maybe I, I have no time to get into the Tanizaki one. So I may limit myself with the first two. Um, in the last section, I'd like to talk about how Japanese writers reacted to, to censorship. Now, in the August 15, 1945, Japan accepted the Potsdam Declaration and unconditionally <laughs> surrendered to the Allied powers. Then the Allied occupation began and lasted uh, for eight years until April 28, 1952. Uh, Douglas MacArthur was stationed in Japan as a supreme commander of Allied powers, and Japan was stripped of its colonial empire and subjected to a foreign military occupation for the first time in its history. These are the things that you can get from history books. But more important than these facts, perhaps, is how this period has been viewed, perceived, and represented by the Japanese. For some people, some Japanese people, the defeat and occupation that ensued was a tragic experience. For them, it was a humiliating time. Japan's effort from the Meiji period on to become a powerful nation comparable to the Western nation was miserably failed. But for other, other Japanese, the period is the time of freedom and democracy. The occupation forces liberated Japanese from mil militarist government and democratized the nation gave Japanese women the right to vote, and liberated them from the feudalistic family system. 
helped Japanese to create new, a new democratic constitution. Americans replaced the old value system with the new better ones. So that these two views had polarized not only the popular memories of the Jap Japanese, ordinary Japanese, but also the scholarly discourse to a certain extent. <coughs> How then did the Japanese literary scholars define this period? For the longest time, they had described the period as the time of liberation and freedom. So they're more towards the second view rather than the first. They depicted it as a kind of literary renaissance where writers were unleashed the creative energy after long, dark ages. Finally, the writers were allowed to fully explore their artistic possibilities. And this type of narrative was established in a very short period of time immediately after the war. And despite various cha challenges, it became a cliche in the literary history up until present. And if you look at the publishing situations in the early post-war Japan, it definitely has the appearance of a literary <laughs> renaissance. For example, new literary magazines were published one after another, not only of serious literature, but of entertainment literature, poetry, classical poetry, foreign literature, and children's literature. There were many politically oriented opinion magazines that were published during this time, and they all had literature sections of serious literature section. This is unthinkable now. That literature was very important back then. It no longer is, unfortunately, in the present Japan. Um, and in all these magazines, the two terms appeared frequently, freedom and democracy. I was reading uh, one of the uh, magazines, literary magazines, with my graduate student last semester, and I found like four columns in one issue of this uh, magazine that has freedom as a title. So it was, it was all over the place. What was remarkable then that this explosion of creative energy itself was the fact that this literary renaissance occurred while the entire publishing industry was under the watch of the censorship apparatus run by foreign forces. When we think of the fact that the very magazines that celebrated freedom and democracy were censored, a question immediately arises. How did the Japanese writers and publishers come to terms with the system that were obviously violating their freedom? Moreover, this was not just any foreign forces. It was the United States, <laughs> the country of democracy. A critic, Eto Jun, was probably the first one to discuss this issue extensively with the concrete examples from the actual censored document. His book, Sealed in Linguistic Space, Censorship by Occupational Forces in the Post-War Japan, came out in 1982 in in Japan and it stirred much discussion. As the book title amply demonstrates, Eto attempted to present the period as a completely secluded linguistic space where the occupiers distorted the discourses of the occupied, molded it as they like. He argued that the Japanese were, as it were, brainwashed, and the censorship was an effective tool for that. So the dichotomy he created was more like the occupier and the uh, the occupier and the occupied, the oppressor and the oppressed. And he was promoting the very first view that this was a very humiliating time in uh, Japanese history. But since Eto's time, the study on occupational censorship made made an amazing stride. <coughs> 
when he started the, his research in the late 70s, the, the documents on the censorship were still unfiled and piled up in cartoon boxes in a room at the University of Maryland library. <coughs> Now these are all made into microfiche and further made accessible by the group of scholars at Waseda University because they constructed the database. So the new studies are coming out. Uh, we're, so we're talking about a, a relatively new field of study, is a study of censorship. Now you can search uh, all the articles by titles and keywords and uh, authors. The collection is called the Prange Collection, named after a personnel who brought the, all the censorship documents back to the United States and donated to the University of Maryland. <coughs> This collection have not only have the documents by the allied censorship authorities, but also contains all the books and newspapers, periodicals that the authorities collected during the years between 1945 to 1949. Most of these um, magazines and books were lost in Japan, so they're, they're only in, all in the United States, not in Japan. So thanks to these efforts, uh, we began to see different aspects of the censorship, and we're still discovering new things. So it's a very exciting um, field as a scholar of the occupation period. When American forces set up the headquarters of the occupation forces in Tokyo, one of their top priority was the control over the Japanese media. As early as September 10th, the SCAP notified the Japanese government of the implementation of the censorship in Japanese media. The press code was issued five days later. The SCAP started the pre-publication censorship of the five major newspapers in Tokyo on October 8th, 1945. So you can see how quickly this, all these things moved and the um, organization was set up. The main organ for this system was called a CCD, the Civil Censorship Detachment, and they conducted uh, extensive censorship on a lot of things. Mass media, like newspapers, magazines, pamphlets, posters, radio, film, theater, as well as the personal media like telegrams and le personal letters. And it was, was in order to run this system this big, the CCD had to f f hire a vast number of personnel. Uh, we have a record that in 18, 1947, 8,100 Japanese were hired to work in this in the CCD, whereas American officers were one-tenth of it. Um, and during the year 1945, the instances of censorship in magazines were only 50 a month. But after 1946, the number constantly marked the three digit a month. This was because, for one, the number of magazines itself were increased dramatically, drastically in 1946, and the system of censorship began to operate more efficiently. By the late 1947, the CCD gradually moved from the pre-publication censorship to post-publication censorship and practically terminated all censorship by October 31st in 1949. So you may think, oh, that short? It actually ended before the occupation period ends. We can think the number of reasons for this brevity. For one, this was, as you can see, it was a costly operation. Oh. The decision to move from the pre-publication censorship to post-publication censorship definitely was a practical one. 
And also another thing that was very important was there was a situation in Japan's side that made this practical decision easy to make. Interestingly, Japanese publishers were all quite obedient to the system. From, um, so in, from American point of view, therefore, the censorship achieved the goal very quickly and was very successful. Of course, we need to think about the implication on Jap Japan's side, what it means to be censorship being very successful. So we're going to come back to this issue later. Okay. Let me then move on to the standard procedure of this system. For the censorship of the magazines, the publishers needed to submit two copies of the Galais to the CCD. In case of periodicals, the team of translator translates the entire table of contents in order to indicate the overall tendency of the magazine. They'll peruse the gare, and when they find something questionable, they translate the passage and take it into a higher rank of examiners. So it's a double uh, staged uh, examination. So oftentimes, the documents contain both a handwritten and neatly typed version of the same translation. The CCD office then, um, or the examiners who make the final decisions are mainly native speakers, American person, occupation personnel. And they make decisions by looking at the typed translation. The CCD office then notifies the result to the publishers, and uh, they keep one copy with them and uh, return one, one to the publisher and the editors of the magazines. There are three different categories so for the result, passed, deleted, and suppressed. Suppression means the publishers must remove the entire article. This is how it looks as if you have this cross line and says suppressed um, hanko on it. Delete, deletion means that they, the publishers can publish the edition of the, that particular issue of the magazine with the instructed passages removed. In that case, the new version needed to be resubmitted. And this is the actual document. You see that the certain passages are crossed out and was instructed to delete. Results are, of course, non-negotiable. There's no way that editors negotiate with the censorship authority. And the reasons for deletion was not given to the publishers. So they have to, they, they only get results, not the reasons. When either a submission or a, a suppression or a deletion happened, the publisher had to suffer great financial damage because they need to redo the typography and need to reprint. On top of that, they need to postpone the publication of that magazine. I also remind you that the paper was still the ration at the time. So it was hard times for the publishers. The suppression, once suppression of the article could deliver damaging flow to the finance of that company, the publishing company. And this financially tight situation of the publishers obviously worked for the censorship because publishers made every effort to minimize the change by self-censoring. So the Japanese publishers had to go over the deleted passages, had to study the deleted cases, and guess what were inappropriate in the eyes of the censorship authorities. At the same time, they have to minimize the delete or suppress results in order to avoid the financial risks. So they themselves become a censorship authority in a way. They internalize the rules and they impose that on the writers. So the system itself contributed to the Japanese publisher's obedience to the censorship. Okay, then what, are the things, what type of things were censored? Um, 
the CCD didn't give the publishers the reason for the particular cases for deletion and suppression, but of course they kept uh, their documents. So we know that um, you know, what kind of reasons they have for or these deletions. I don't have exact statistics, but th these are the reasons that uh, we can see often in the documents related to literature. Military propaganda, understandably. Uh, fraternization, this refers to the scene in fiction or in the newspapers uh, talking about uh, American scholars having an intimate relationship with Japanese women, especially prostitutes. Disturb public tranquility, we see this a lot too. Uh, basically referring to when a literary text is describing the destruction in the city. Um, any reference to atomic bomb was uh, censored, the, uh, the target of the censorship. Critical to, uh, reference that is critical to the occupation of policies. Also the inappropriate reference to the SCAP appears quite often. Um, as a reason for deletions. <clears throat> the last one is an interesting one, an inappropriate reference to the SCAP. Because basically, the SCAP banned all the reference to the General MacArthur, SCAP, occupational forces, and allied powers, as well as all the they banned all the reference to the censorship and the press code. So they consider any reference to the SCAP considered inappropriate, in other words. The example, the first example I'm going to talk about is actually related to this inappropriate reference to the SCAP and the censorship. <clears throat> Let me move on to the example now. The first instance of the censor literary work I selected is a short story by Nakano Shigeharu, a leftist writer, leading leftist writer, throughout the years before and, and after the war. <coughs> Excuse me. Five Cups of Sake is the title of the work. The story consists of a letter written by an old school teacher who thinks that Japan should be led by the Communist Party, but considers that it is not doing a proper job. The letter is addressed to his friend, who is an active member of the party. How Nakano framed this letter is interesting. The protagonist is writing writing this letter while she, he's drunk with five cups of sake, which is specially delivered to celebrate the new Japanese constitution. Now, intoxication can work in both ways, like the negative ways and positive way. That he's drunk, on the one hand, can have a positive meaning that he is celebrating the event. But on the other hand, it can taken as a sign of despair. So this is a novelistic device to communicate the protagonist's ambivalence toward the new democratic constitution. By extension, the entire political situation that Japan is in. For him, the protagonist, the new constitution is something to celebrate because it, it is essential to have the democratic constitution if Japan were to present itself as an independent nation. But then he also thinks that it is fatally flawed, and he cannot help but deplore over it. For us, the readers, the effect of alcohol on the narrator, the, the protagonist, makes it difficult to assess the seriousness of his works. So ambivalence exists in every layer of the story. I'll first show you the version that was after the passage is taken out. It reads, so many aspects of our situation are exemplified in the Constitution. It could be used to teach us so many things. 
And why couldn't the Communist Party have been the first to perceive this and to call out to the people? I'm taking this from the, um, the wonderful translation done by Brett DeBarry. This reads very naturally and smoothly, but there is a deleted section here in between many things and, and why. But if you look at just this passage, you can see the Constitution is represented positively while the protagonist is annoyed with the Communist Party. Now, let me put the deleted section back into the passage. I'm taking the translation from the, the censorship document. So the translation is done by the examiner. So many aspects of our Constitution are exemplified in the Constitution. It could be used to teach us so many things. The morning it went to the diet, or perhaps the day before, the ESCAP announced in the newspaper that the preliminary draft had been written by the Japanese. This is our constitution, supposedly being created by Japanese, and yet the government, Japanese government, has had to beg the foreigners to announce that a preliminary draft was written by the a Japanese. Can our people accept this abject position of their government in silence? And why couldn't the Communist Party have been first to perceive this and to call out to the people? Interesting, right? <laughs> the meaning is completely changed here. Now you can see the Constitution is represented in a completely different way. In this passage, the protagonist thinks the Constitution is respectable in its content, but the way it was presented to mass media is problematic. We know from the historical study that this newspaper is not lying. The draft it was written by a Japanese, though it was not without the interference of the ESCAP. But that's not the issue that he wants to raise. What he was pointing out is the twisted relationship between the occupier and the occupied. When the occupier is trying to establish a democratic state for the occupied, this is a contradiction that lined at the center of the Allied occupation, the democracy from top down. In order for Japanese to be truly democratic, they needed to make the democratic constitution with their own hands voluntarily. However, in order to make the democratic constitution, um, in order to make it democratic, in American eyes, the Japanese government needed the help of the Americans. But then that help has to be erased because the Japanese voluntariness had to be uh, foregrounded. The for help needed to be invisible. So the occupation force needed to be there, but at the same time, it needed to be erased. And this erasure further needed to be authorized by the United States. So the story actually captures this complexity in a short passage. Let's see how the CCD read this story. The examiner signed his or her name, E. Sugimura, at the very top here, E. Sugimura. We don't know whether this is a man or woman. The page on your left, translation of the deleted passage, the reason for this deletion is indicated at the bottom of, of this document. It says, in app ref to ESCAP, inappropriate reference to the ESCAP. Now, Sugiura-san added a long note, which is on the other side. I'll read it out loud. Implied sarcasm and almighty U.S. influence. This is, a, this is a novel in the form of a note by Juji Nakano. Sugiura-san made the mistake and the name of the, the writer. It's not Juji, but it's Shigeharu. One of the unique writers that the present Japan has. The above portion translated by EX, examiner, as an objectionable seems to imply sarcasm on the Japanese political setup under the occupation, according to the examiner's judgment. 
Throughout the work, examiners found nowhere except the portion in question any tone of ex ex expression objectionable. From Sugiura-san's memo, we learned that the CCD finds objectionable was what find what the CCD finds objectionable was sarcasm and the representation of the U.S. power. The term sarcasm can be translated into ambivalence in our terms. It points to the narrator's tone of both being positive and negative at the same time. By deleting that section, the examiner effectively reduced the ambiguity into a single positive meaning. Another interesting phrase, almighty U.S. influence, shows that the CCD wanted to er what CCD wanted to erase was its own existence as a censorship apparatus because the passage refers precisely to the U.S. power that is ex exerted over Japanese mass media. So in a way, this is a double erasure. The CCD erased the statement that pointed out its own act of erasing. If I were to add another layer of irony to this, I should mention that, that this new constitution is the one that stipulated the freedom of speech. The CCD's desire to erase its own existence manifests itself in various ways. As I mentioned earlier, the CCD instructed the publisher uh, to delete the objectionable section by taking out the passage completely and connect before and after of the deletion smoothly. The publishers were also in strictly instructed not to leave in the unnatural space so that the readers would not suspect the censorship. So m censorship must not leave any trace in itself on the page. Now, for the Japanese publishers, this came as a kind of culture shock because they were in a completely different culture of censorship during the war. They were used to the censorship during the war, but they were, had a very different culture about the censorship. They have been using they have been using things called Huseji, hidden letters. It can literally be translated as hidden letters for the deleted section. I'll show you an interesting galley in which you can see that cultural difference. Um, let's see. Okay, this is an essay entitled Insatsu Sare Nakatta Genko, The Unprinted Manuscripts, written by Komiya Toyotaka, a writer known as a disciple of Soseki. This article is supposed to appear in the first issue of a literary journal called Ningen, this is after the war. So this is, a, we're, I mean, we're talking about very censorship, allied censorship in the very early stage. First, the CCD told the publishers to delete extensive portion of the essay. <laughs> so what the publishers did was to destroy the correspondence portion of the letterpress and reprint it, the page. Can you see the smashed letters? All these are, all these are smashed letters. They sort of destroy the surface of the, the letterpress okay. and just print it as, as you see. And this was how they did how they um, did during the war. So they assumed that that's what CCD wanted. They did the same way. This was called Fuseji. So there's a stark difference between the wartime censorship and the ASCAP censorship. Japanese government chose to present their power visually on the page, thereby suggesting that they made those publishers destroy the original this way. So this is the, their way of asserting the power, whereas the CCD wanted to erase the, their power. That was their way of showing the power. <laughs> 
I'll probably need to come back to this again. Let me move on to the second example. My second example is taken from the short story written by Nagayo Yoshiro entitled The Story for an Hour and a Half. Nagayo was from a very different background from Nakano. He was one of the Shirakawa school writers who tend to be critical of the Marxist type of political commitment. I chose his work not so much because he makes a sharp comment on a political situation, but because perhaps inadvertently, raises a question of gender in the relationship between the occupier and the occupied. There are two main characters in the novel. One is Eiji, middle-aged writer, who is almost identical to the author. Another is Teruko, a young wife of a French literature scholar and a former bar girl. Eiji knew her from the bar in Ginza. But she married to one of her customers and left as the war got severer. Eiji, too, sought refuge in the countryside. Uh, shortly after the war, Eiji and Tergo bumped into each other and uh, on the train bound for Tokyo. As they renew their friendship, Tergo begins to complain about her husband who constantly criticizes her as being old-fashioned, feudalistic, and hence unfit to the new democratic era. Demokratiki is the, sorry, I'm in the wrong. Okay, demokratiki is the term that she uses. She's not demokratiki. And she confesses quite honestly that she doesn't really understand the new democratic values that are promoted after the defeat. She doesn't really understand what the equality between men and women means. While she attributes this to, to her, herself not being properly educated, she also instinctively knows that her husband does not really care about the democratic values. He's just using this to give her upper hand. She blames her husband, saying that she, he is feminine in his insidiousness. <laughs> so the story reflects the confusion concerning the gender roles caused by the democratic reform in the post-defeat Japan. It doesn't really constitute a criticism toward the occupation policy. The focus is more on the bewilderment of the ordinary people who did not exactly know how to, these abstract concepts like equality between men and women can be realized in the everyday life. Here's the original galley. It's, it's a quite huge portion is taken out. Let me read out the translation of the deleted passage. I have taken this from the censored documents. Look over there, master, Teruko pointed and whispered. When each of us was appreciating the evening sight outside the window after having talked of our latest experience mixed with the old stories, and the train stopped in the Asakawa station, on the platform beyond, there was a GI walking arm in arm with a Japanese girl. Yes. What do you think of a things like that, Master? What do I think? That cannot be helped, you know? In a way, that's something which had been uh, forcibly suppressed so far. But you don't like it, don't you? Something unpleasant. Detestable, huh? Of course, many of them are forced to do so. Perhaps just about the time when we get the new rice this fall, lots of blue-eyed babies will come out one after another. Earlier than that, maybe at the time when the sweet potatoes come out. The scene is, in fact, insignificant in terms of plot. But in terms of gender construction with the, within the story, the existence of this Japanese girl who looks physically intimate with the American GI is, is significant. The text doesn't say clearly that she is a pampan, a prostitute who is mainly catered to the occupation soldiers, but it is clear that the readers of the time, and obviously to the examiners of the CCD. As I mentioned earlier, 
they classified this type of description under the categories of fraternization. <laughs> Um, there's a fascinating study on the representation of pambans in early post-war Japanese novels by Michael Molaski. The American Occupation of Japan in Okinawa Literature and Memory is the title of the book. In his book, Molaski pointed out the ambiguity of, of its existence. He argued that, I quote, on the one hand, the pampan is depicted as a vulnerable and tragic figure worthy of public sympathy, Yet, she also represents free-flowing female desire and uncontrolled sexuality, which threaten middle-class patriarchal values such as propriety, domesticity, and chastity." Unquote. You can see that the, these reaction of both male and female protagonists exemplify this ambiguity. A.G., the male protagonist, shows some sympathy, <laughs> but at the same time makes sarcastic remarks about the blue-eyed babies who potentially threaten the middle class patriarchal values. For Teruko, the issue seems to be more immediate since her background is a, bar, a former bar girl. But then why the CCD is so sensitive about the representations of Pampant? The scene is a problematic. Not so much because it shows the occupiers are taking advantage of the women in the occupied, co occupied country, but because it shows quite plainly the power relations between the Americans and the Japanese men. The competition among men is the issue here, while the women is just a trophy in this competition. What is excluded structurally from the scene was the Japanese men. Eiji, the defeated Japanese male, cannot help but accept the situation. Given the goal of the occupation forces to make the occupiers stand on their feet, becoming the democratic subject, this power imbalance is problematic. What is made clear in this case is that this power imbalance between the occupier and the occupied is actually gendered. It's between occupier men, occupied men. It exists between men and men, whereas women are treated as a secondary citizen in this issue. What is more, in order to conceive this scene as an indicating power imbalance, as the CCD did, you need to assume that Japanese women belong to Japanese men. You can only interpret this scene as a power imbalance if you have this assumption. American GIs going out with the Japanese women means taking the power away from Japanese men. They're stealing the possession of Japanese men. What I find more interesting in this most interesting in this case is the male protagonist, which is almost like male, the, the author, actually shares this assumption with the CCD censorship authority. His sarcastic tone suggests that. So we can see the author, Japanese author and the CCD sh actually shares assumption in gender issues. Of course, the gender imbalance, gender bias on the examiner's side need to be explored more with more concrete cases. This is, but it raises an interesting issue, I think. Do, how much time do I have left? Five, Five minutes, okay. Um, Since I talked about uh, these two writers, <laughs> I'm going to skip the, the Tanizaki part. Um, I'd like to talk about the reaction of these three writers, well, two writers that we talked about. Nakano and Nagayo actually makes a clear contrast. Nakano is the most critical of the occupation censorship, whereas Nagayo is, is a kind of indifferent. Um, and I would say, typically, indifference 
is the main attitude of the Japanese writers. Nakano is a very rare case. Nakano's protest begins in 1953, right after the occupation. He published a recovered version, but uh, very carefully without any indication. So, so sort of he secretly published with the deleted section back and the original. In 1961, he reprinted the deleted version, deleted section, when he compiled the first completed works of Zenshu of, of himself. But he attached a separate enda, appendix with explanation. This part is deleted because of the censorship. When he's compiling the second collection of completed volume, then he included the recovered <laughs> version in this collected, S collected works and then attached an essay criticizing severely of um, the occupation censorship. He said, they did not even allow us to use Huseji, the, the, cover, the hidden letters. And he concluded, the post-war censorship by the Allied forces was actually severer than the wartime censorship by the military government. This was his conclusion. Okay. Okay. Next is Nagayo's reaction. the writer of the story for <laughs> Hour and a Half, our second example. Nangayo put down his thoughts when he saw the deleted section of this story on, on the, in a diary, and he published that diary in 1954 after the occupation, two years after the occupation. This is what he wrote in 1946 on his diary. A page of the manuscript must have gone missing Either the editor lost it at the paint printing house or they lost it while they are copying <laughs> my bad handwriting for typographers. And because of that, the story was simplified and flattened. I was quite disappointed with this. <laughs> this tells us a lot of things. First, um, it tells us the publisher's culture at the time. That it's, there's a secretism going on, not only on the G SCAP side, but the publisher's side. They're not telling the author about the censorship. Also, it shows the chaotic state of the publishing business, because the manuscript is obviously not never returned to the author. But lastly, and more significantly, the author did not seem to feel the need to explain to the reader of what really happened. He's, re he's publishing this diary in 1954, so if he, by, by then, he must have find, found that out, what happened. Or at least he can make a guess that it was the censorship, right? But he didn't say anything about that in his diary. He didn't add any comment to it. He didn't explain that at all in the appendix or anything. It was total, uh, totally ignoring this, uh, what, what was the truth. He also never recovered deleted sections in the later reprinted versions. So it's interesting that the author did not seem to feel it necessary to problematize the censorship, despite he was very, the, the fact that he was very disappointed with the deletion, or to discuss the political artistic implications of it. And as I said earlier, this attitude of Nagayo is in fact typical of Japanese writers. So in the context of the Japanese literary world, realistic, practical, and indifferent attitude was prevailing even after the occupation. And of course, from the US point of view, you can say it's a very obedient um, culture. Now, to end my uh, presentation, uh, and. Uh, Censorship studies, there are a lot to be, still a lot to be done. More factual details of the system of the censorship needs to be found out. More, more research needed with the case study approach. Each 
we need to look at each literary work and see what was deleted, what was not deleted. Also, we need more comparative approach, comparative approach, sorry. Um, comparative meaning you have to compare pre-war and during the war, pre-war and post-war. Also, in, the system needs to be compared with other areas of the U.S. occupation, something like, the, for example, Korea. What was censorship in Korea? I don't know much about it. We need to do more comparative uh, research. Definitely more research needed on gender and race issues. And I personally find the last one most interesting, more research on how the censorship was actually represented by the Japanese writers. We need a lot of archival research to do this, but 